Hello, everyone. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our 23rd annual public lecture series. Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We take many approaches to this work. We offer science training for professional journalists from all over the world such as our annual science immersion workshop for journalists, which is just concluding this week. We offer communication training for scientists from graduate students through professionals. We organize the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings people together from across the country to share practices and research that make science communication more inclusive and equitable. And we offer public events like this one. This, of course, is a very different year for us, as it is for everyone. Because of the pandemic, we moved our annual science immersion workshop for journalists and this public lecture series online. While this required many changes, it also offered the opportunity to pivot in some important ways. Originally, this year's lecture series was going to explore the practical implications of climate change. Specifically, we wanted to feature speakers who could discuss the ways we are already witnessing climate change and what we could expect to see with a global average temperature increase of two degrees Celsius. That's the limit that the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was designed to achieve. As the coronavirus began to spread and it became clear that COVID-19 would have significant effects on every aspect of our lives for the foreseeable future, we decided to expand our lecture series to look at how the pandemic might affect our responses to climate change. Then over the last month, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rhea Milton, Dominique Fells, and Rayshard Brooks, among countless other Black Americans before them, forced a national reckoning with anti-Black violence and all the ways that racism is structurally embedded in our society. This conversation is painful, difficult, and essential. To play a small role in this public discussion, we decided to pivot our annual lecture series again to address the intersections of these three critical issues, climate change, COVID-19, and systemic racism. Climate change is often discussed as the great equalizer, but that's not accurate, really. It is more accurately described as the great magnifier because it magnifies existing inequities. We've seen the same problems with COVID-19, which has disproportionately affected people of color in the United States. Obviously, we can only begin to scratch the surface of these intertwined challenges in a one-week webinar series. However, we hope this week's talks will help you consider new perspectives and, most importantly, provide ideas for action. With that introduction, I'm thrilled to introduce today's lecture and speakers. Although you may have heard people refer to climate resilience or climate adaptation or even other terms, what these have in common is the fact that we need plans for responding to all the ways that climate change is already affecting our lives in order to sustain our ecosystems, communities, ways of living, and economies. According to the Georgetown Climate Center, 41 US states have climate adaptation plans in place. There are at least 50 tribal climate adaptation plans in place across the US. In short, there's a great deal of activity, not just in the US, but around the world to figure out the steps needed to build climate resilience. However, climate adaptation requires funding, whether it comes from federal governments, local taxes, the private sector, or a combination of sources. As COVID-19 saps the budgets of these typical sources, tribes, states, and municipalities may find themselves struggling to achieve their adaptation goals. Furthermore, the communities hit hardest by COVID-19, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, as well as those living in poverty, are simultaneously on the front lines of climate change, suffering disproportionately from, for example, heat waves, air pollution, food insecurity, and substandard infrastructure. Once again, this shows why it's so important to discuss climate change, COVID-19, and structural inequalities comprehensively rather than separately. Today's panel will discuss these challenges and what they might mean for the future of climate resilience efforts. First, we'll hear from Ms. Melissa Roberts, the founder and executive director of the American Flood Coalition, 
Ms. Roberts leads policy development and guides strategy for the coalition's mission of advocating for national solutions to flooding and sea level rise. The coalition brings together a wide range of partners, including local and national elected officials, military leaders, businesses, and civic and educational organizations from across the country. Previously, Ms. Roberts was the Director of Strategy at First Street Foundation, a tech nonprofit that quantifies and communicates America's changing flood risk. Before that, she was an engagement manager at McKinsey & Company, where she specialized in infrastructure finance and planning, working with national governments, cities, major foundations, private sector investors, and developers. She was a lead author on the publication, Financing Change, How to Mobilize Private Sector Financing for Sustainable Infrastructure. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Rebecca Carter, who is Deputy Director of the Climate Resilience Practice at the World Resources Institute. Dr. Carter works on governance issues related to climate resilience, including the transparency, equity, and inclusivity of adaptation planning and implementation processes at local to national scales. She's worked on climate change issues for much of her career in academic, nonprofit, and federal government roles. Today, <clears throat> Dr. Carter will discuss a variety of efforts that the World Resources Institute has regarding adaptation. Um, but she's worked on agricultural adaptation, the climate change implications of water policies, how to make climate information more useful for diverse user groups, and intersections of land use planning and climate change. Prior to joining the World Resources Institute, she was a Foreign Service Environment Officer with the U.S. Agency for International Development. She was posted in Indonesia, Uganda, and the Philippines, and worked on clean energy, biodiversity conservation, water and sanitation, forestry issues, and climate resilience. And then finally, we'll hear from Mr. Don Sampson. Mr. Sampson is the Climate Change Project Coordinator for the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, or ATNI, and president of Seventh Generation LLC, a tribal advisory and consultation company that works to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of tribal government and business operations. Just this past March, he was recognized by Eco America as one of 10 finalists for the American Climate Leadership Award for his work to help tribes and First Nations in the US and Canada advance their own climate adaptation planning. Previously, Mr. Sampson served as a board member of the First Nations Development Institute, as the Director of Native Programs at EcoTrust, an Oregon nonprofit, and Executive Director of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation located in Northeastern Oregon. The Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation is the government of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla Tribes, a confederation formed by treaty in 1855. Mr. Sampson also served as executive director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, which was established by the Yakima, Warm Springs, Umatilla, and Nez Perce tribes in 1977. In that role, he assisted with tribal management of the Columbia Basin's salmon resources. He's also elected as chairman of the Umatilla Tribes Board of Trustees from 1993 to 1997. And with that, I'm very excited to turn this over to the people you came to hear from today. So we'll start with Melissa Roberts. Still muted, Melissa. Oh, there you go. great. Thanks so much and really grateful to get to be here today and speak on this topic. I'm just gonna share my screen. Great, so as Sunshine mentioned, you know, the American Flood Coalition is focused on flooding and sea level rise and how we adapt to these challenges across the nation. And our perspective is really informed by the fact that we're a coalition of folks on the front lines of these issues. So cities and towns, elected officials, businesses, military groups, civic organizations, as well as members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. And we spend about half of our time with communities on the ground, thinking about how they can plan, communicate, get community input, and finance the types of changes that need to be made. And then the other half of our work is really around making sure to lift up those local voices and demand better adaptation response at the state and federal level, because we see the challenges that our communities on the front lines are dealing with, and we know that the federal response 
just really isn't meeting the scale of the challenges that we see on the ground. So, you know, let's get right into it. To start off, when we think about our system of adaptation and from our perspective coming at this, thinking about kind of flooding in all its forms, whether it's hurricane storm surge, heavy precipitation, riverine flooding, what we really see is that the faults in the system are clear and we need to dramatically rethink and reshape how as a country we engage in adaptation because it's just not working. Right now we know that the reality of these types of disasters is on kind of a steadily increasing trend. One way to kind of illustrate just how quickly this is increasing is that when we look at billion dollar disasters, which is often where you see a lot of federal involvement when they cross that threshold, from 1980 to 2010, on average, every decade, we'd see about 40 of those billion dollar disasters across the country. And in the last five years alone, we had 69 of them. So we went from you know, 40 over a decade to almost 70 in just five years. So we're seeing a lot more disasters because of you know, higher seas, stronger storms, more frequent flooding, and our disaster preparation response and recovery systems simply haven't kept pace. So as we see more and more disasters happening at once, we're not equipped to respond to them adequately. And because we're so underprepared, when we end up in a situation like we're in today, with COVID being layered on top and really creating a dual disaster scenario, the inadequacies of that system become so apparent because we're trying to not just deal with the first set of kind of natural disasters and hurricanes that we know about and didn't have systems in place for, but a more complicated response to a dual disaster. And the reason this matters so much is because when our systems don't work well, the people that are hurt are our most vulnerable populations because risk is not distributed evenly in this country, especially because of our history of redlining and other ways in which we've concentrated risk. It's not even. And so when we then see systems that don't work well to both mitigate risk from things like flooding before it occurs or respond adequately afterward, what we're seeing on the whole is vulnerabilities in the system that are passed on to frontline communities who experience disproportionate harmful impacts from flooding and other sorts of adaptation challenges. We focus in on flooding in our work, but I think it's really illustrative of what we're seeing across the board with these adaptation challenges and it's kind of a good illustration because it's the most common and the costliest natural disaster we have in the US. And so thinking a little bit more specifically about this dual disaster that I mentioned of COVID and what this has shown us in this specific moment, what we're really seeing is that the overlap of COVID-19 and flooding has really placed stressors on an already broken system and revealed a lot of the things that we knew weren't working, but strained them to such an extent that it's becoming even more apparent. And I think the first thing to know here is just that, unfortunately, COVID-19 and flood risks are playing out in the same places. So we have a lot of locations that are having to deal with these overlapping challenges. So you can see from the map here that a lot of these places with red circles that are experiencing COVID outbreaks are the same places that either are experiencing or are likely to experience spring flooding and are also at risk of hurricane activity, which unfortunately this year is actually predicted to be worse than normal. And what it means in the near term as the challenge for these locations is that it's really hard to deal with these overlapping disasters, not just because it's two disasters happening at once, but because responding to either of them often makes it harder to adequately respond to the other. So the ways in which we would normally respond to say a hurricane have the threat of actually making our public health crisis worse. Things like evacuating people from a flood prone area and putting them together in a gym, you know, obviously could make a contagious health crisis a lot worse. And also the challenges we've seen from COVID have the potential to put additional strain on our flood response. So the way that we've already strained our social safety net, a lot of the 
factors in the community that come into play with a flood disaster, like local food banks and volunteers are already strained or won't be able to respond. And so these are both really impacting each other in a way that's playing out in a really troubling way. Um, the American Flood Coalition, along with the American Public Health Association, actually just released a dual disaster handbook with six concrete steps for local leaders around the steps they can take centered on vulnerable populations to try to address the overlap of these two issues. But I think what we're really seeing is we shouldn't be in this situation. In a lot of ways, COVID you know, caught, was you know, surprising and hard to predict for many of us, but the trend of what we've seen with escalating risks of flooding and not keeping pace was something we knew about and allowed to happen that's making this dual disaster situation a lot worse. And one thing I really wanna emphasize is it's not just the near-term risk we're seeing of how to manage this dual disaster as it plays out this spring flooding season or this hurricane season, but what's gonna happen in the years to come. Because we know that a lot of municipalities are experiencing extraordinary resource constraints in their budget, and that could have impacts for years to come. We're already seeing mitigation projects get delayed and adaptation projects get delayed in ways that could impact these communities for years to come if we don't see a really robust federal stimulus focused on the most vulnerable communities. And kind of on that note, thinking about who gets impacted when we see these strains, I think it's really important to think about our current system of adaptation, who's at risk, and who the system helps. Because right now, what we have absolutely seen play out over the last couple decades is that our current system of adaptation really exposes and exacerbates social inequities and systemic racism rather than redress it. We know that, as I mentioned, risk just isn't distributed equally across the country and across populations. We see that low-income populations and communities of color are more vulnerable to flooding. And this is specifically because of our history of systemic racism, of things like redlining that have concentrated risk in certain communities. And instead of responding to that history in our adaptation policies and redressing it, we actually have a whole slew of policies that unfortunately make those disparities even worse in the way we invest before and after disasters that lead us to really need a whole scale rethink of the way we do adaptation. So one data point I really wanted to point out that I think illustrates this in a really stark way is that extensive research has shown that when you look at counties that experience major disasters and you track households for the next 10 plus years, Black and Latinx households that experience major disasters go on to lose on average $27,000 to $29,000 in wealth, while white households in the same area go on to gain an average of $126,000 in wealth. And I mean, we don't need more than that to know that our system is absolutely broken and is doubling down and exacerbating the inequalities that already exist. And this is also encoded in our federal programs. A lot of the ways in which the federal government decides which communities to invest in, everything from who's eligible for grants, which levies to repair first, is often dependent on communities being able to invest a lot upfront in expensive pre-development costs that make it really hard for poorer communities to ever get federal aid. And we also include as part of the benefit cost analysis, the wealth of the surrounding area. And so this is kind of throughout the federal adaptation system and really needs to be completely changed if we're to have any sort of system that works for Americans. And the last thing I'll mention is all of this really combines to have a disaster recovery lag, especially for low-income communities and communities of color. And so we see that after disasters strike, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And this is especially problematic because we're putting more and more money into this system of post-disaster recovery. The last few years have seen more disasters and more money flow through this system than we're used to. 
and this is on trend to continue with more and more of these billion dollar disasters. So we're putting you know, more and more money into a system that's broken and using this as a major way that we're actually building infrastructure in our country. And if we don't get to the heart of this and change the way we do adaptation policy, we're gonna end up with more and more outcomes like we've seen that just accelerate inequality without really reducing risk or protecting the most vulnerable populations. And so what do we do about this? I know I've laid out a lot of ways in which our system of adaptation doesn't work, partly because in a lot of ways at the federal level, it's not actually a system. It's a lot of different programs that have kind of de developed independently and are cobbled together to, you know, in different ways be part of a system that was never thought of nationally or cohesively. But there are some rays of hope and some really promising models that we're seeing that I want to end on. So we know that we need really big change and we also see great community-led solutions that I think can lead us towards the type of paradigm we need going forward. So looking at Iowa, one really interesting model that we've seen and are excited about is that Iowa's State Flood Center has partnered with a conservation group there to model the benefit of having farmers plant a second crop in addition to their cash crop that could absorb more flood water and they're seeing that they think it could actually reduce flooding 40 to 60 percent which is a huge change and would be extremely cost effective and not only that but would provide another source of income for farmers another model we've seen that's really exciting is in harris county which recently passed a landmark 2.5 billion dollar bond for flood control projects and shortly after we saw community leading groups like sear and the home coalition Put, pass a successful resolution uh, by referendum um, in August of last year to say that the county needed to use a social vulnerability index and have a community oversight board that would help make sure that the money was directed in ways that allowed most vulnerable citizens to benefit from it. And this is a model we really want to see across the country when money is being spent. And part of the way we're trying to do that as the Flood Coalition is by partnering with groups like Bipartisan Policy Center in our Adaptation Working Group, where we're bringing together multiple groups that work on this at the national level and saying, how do we really address the fundamental flaws in the way we go about adaptation and make it responsive to the challenges and needs that we see today? And how do we lift up these great local models and use these to inform what we need to see at the state and federal level? So, we're looking towards trying to bring more of those into robust planning and shifting the way we do this. And really grateful to get the chance to talk to you and looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so one quick question for you, maybe not quick, I, I take that back. Does the American Flood Coalition have a policy on the National Flood Insurance Program or take a position? Yeah. So a lot of folks in our coalition do. One thing that all of the members of our coalition do agree on is that the place we need to start is with updated accurate maps. This is a huge problem, especially when you think about the fact that the entire, most of the interior of the country is under mapped and that the current maps don't look at combined flooding. So if you're a homeowner, you don't, or a renter, you know, or someone who lives in the country, you don't care if your home floods because it's heavy precipitation or riverine or tidal, you just care that it floods. But we're communicating to people via the flood maps in a way that's incredibly confusing and really underplays risk for a lot of people. And the way this plays out is that in places like Texas with Harvey, you know, a lot of three fourths of the claims were coming from people who didn't understand their flood risk and didn't have flood insurance because they were told they weren't in a floodplain. So that's a short way of saying we've got to start with the maps and then from there we've got a lot of work to do and we're a 200 member coalition that has a lot of different opinions on where we go after that. Fair enough. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to Dr. Rebecca Carter now. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen successfully. Let's see. And then this thing. 
Yeah, am I good to go? Okay, got it. All right, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here um, to speak with you today. Excited to talk about communities at risk for e during economic turmoil, but I also wanted to talk about some of the solutions for that, um, kind of on a global scale. Certainly not that we think at WRI that we have all of the answers, but we have some ideas for how to get there that you know maybe journalists in particular might, um, might find interesting. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, maybe I'll start with mentioning that I actually trained as a journalist. Um, journalism was my, was my first degree. And we work very closely with journalists now because we know that the work that you do is absolutely essential to making our work have more impact. It's one thing to do the work, you know, but another thing to have people actually know about it so that it, it can improve things. Um, this was just my little cheat sheet about, you know, what the session was meant to be about, talking about significant progress in adaptation. How do we know we're making it? Um, economic uncertainties. I think what I'm going to focus most on is equitable adaptation strategies that prioritize frontline communities. Uh, let's see, for those of you who might not be familiar with WRI, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of explain who we are and what we do. Um, we are a global research organization and we have offices, I think we're up to seven or eight, um, including in Africa, Mexico, as well as China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and the US. We work on seven key issues, and they are climate, energy, food, forests, water, cities, and the ocean. So rather than try to talk about one specific area of our work, I'm going to walk you through an example in a few minutes that I think illustrates sort of the, some of the foundation of um, how we think about these issues of, of equity and social justice. Um, I wanted to just point out here this little tagline uh, that we use that, that really is does come through in, I think, our best work. Um, I'd like to say all of it, but at least our best work, um, which is count it, change it, scale it. And I'm going to get back to that in a few minutes when I walk you through this example. Um, as far as dealing with COVID and building back better, um, I wanted to point out that on our website, we have a COVID-19 resource center that has, for each of those, those vast areas that I mentioned, cities and forests and climate and food and oceans, um, there are resources there that, you know, sometimes it's data. There's also some analysis of which types of policies seem to be best, um, you know, ideas for how to move forward. So depending on what kind of specific issues you're working on, you may find this um, a, a useful resource. Um, we are addressing COVID, I would say, throughout our programs. This is an example um, from my colleague Nambi in India, who is head of our our climate adaptation program there, um, where he actually looked at some of the very same issues that Melissa just mentioned. You know, how do you keep people out of harm's way from cyclones in, in this, this case um, during the time of COVID where people need to evacuate, but it's not safe to go to shelters, you know, so people are very much caught between a rock and a hard place. And it is indeed the people who are, you know, the poorest and most vulnerable people who are most at risk from these situations. Um, and I just wanted to add a quick note on blogs. Um, blogs are actually quite important in WRI. And I think as journalists, you may find these a, a useful resource. I mean, they are our opportunity to get beyond the big study, the big database, and just sort of crystallize what the main messages are um, for all of these different situations that we work on. Um, let's see. So I wanted to take a second to talk about resources that journalists might find helpful. Um, we have on our website many different data resources. Um, this is a, a picture of sea level rise. Um, for, we, we have them for many different cities. It's on a platform called Resource Watch. And there's lots of, I think, good stories there about what the data means. Um, and I think journalists might find that a useful resource. I also want to point out that we do a lot of analysis, like this picture on the right, um, policy interventions in Bangladesh that are dramatically reducing the number of people who die from cyclones. And this is climate adaptation in action. Um, and this is part of the evidence base that we're trying to build that, that lets us know that we're headed in the right direction, or that there is hope, that it's not just about scary climate change impacts, but that there are solutions out there and that there are good case studies that, that I think we can all learn from. Um, this is the, the homepage of our climate resilience practice. Um, I'm not going to get into too many details because time is short, but we're a team of about 14 people. Um, most of us are in the US. We do have 
colleagues in India, um, in the UK, and you know, other colleagues in WRI around the world. We work on three main areas. One of them is mainstreaming adaptation, and that's this idea that for adaptation to really take hold in the way that it needs to, it can't just be seen as an environmental issue. It has to be mainstreamed or integrated into what the health department does, what the finance ministry does, what the Department of Agriculture does. So that's one area of work um, that we work on. A second one is transformative adaptation. And we think about this mostly in agriculture so far. And what we're looking at there is, what do you do when these relatively minor adaptation measures are just not going to be enough when you start reaching the limitations of them? How do you um, get communities to make major shifts? Maybe it's in where they live, maybe it's in how they live. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on agriculture where we're looking at, you know, how do you plot a smoother transition from, you know, let's say a particular type of crop or a particular type of livestock no longer really being viable because it's getting too hot, because there are too many new pests, um, because it's too dry or too wet. So we have a body of work in that area. We're also the co-managers of something called the Global Commission on Adaptation. And that is this um, global effort to really move the needle on adaptation to climate change. Um, it's co-chaired by Bill Gates, Ban Ki-moon, and Kristalina Gorgieva. And we have commissioners from private sector, um, you know, governments, um, research organizations who are really getting together to say, you know, the adaptation needs are huge. How do we get more attention for this issue? Um, but I did want to focus most of my time today on vulnerable communities. A lot of our work is in vulnerable communities. They, they are at the forefront of the type of work we do because they are the ones that are getting hit hardest by climate change. Um, most of my work is international. We, WRI has worked in the US, but we, we don't actually do a lot of adaptation work there, in part because there are strong organizations like, like Melissa's and I think Don's um, that, are, that are doing a lot on that front. Um, but I think maybe what's more important to think about and what I thought might be helpful um, thinking back on my own journalism training was to think about the kinds of questions that journalists ask, right? So going back to who, what, why, where, when, and how. Um, you know, we try throughout our work to ask questions like who is most vulnerable? What makes them vul most vulnerable? Vulnerable to what exactly? Where are they located? And what are the best solutions? You know, is it, are there solutions that um, we can find in communities that they're already starting to implement? Is it that higher level policies are needed? Is it that more funding needs to go towards some of these solutions? We also think about who needs to be involved to make change happen? And what does that change look like? Um, and I wanna walk you through an example that I think sort of illustrates this approach in action maybe. So this is a, a blog that our um, executive director, um, Manish Bhapna, put out with Sheila Patel, who is the head of Slum Dwellers International just recently. Um, City leaders must prioritize climate resilience of vulnerable communities. And so just to walk you through, you know, I mentioned this count it, scale it, change it um, rubric that we use. And just to see that in action, I took some excerpts from this blog um, and put a, you know, added a list of key questions, which I actually cannot see because of uh, how Zoom works, but I'm gonna wing it here. Um, but, you know, I just thought as journalists, these are probably questions that you're already asking, but maybe they would also spur some questions about sort of how to go a little bit deeper to address, address these equity issues, social justice, and you know, trying to, to call these critical issues to light. So in this article, we see this count it um, part of the work displayed in that you know, it talks about the impacts being disproportionately affecting people living in poverty, 800 million people worldwide living in informal settlements. So that tells us something about how big the problem is. Um, and what exactly these communities are at greater risk to of. Uh, um, you know, these are the people who are facing uh, the harshest realities of climate change. So this should be a higher priority. And then this point that I, I thought was quite interesting, this, um, this study from Slum and Schachtwelders International, so our partner in this work, that illustrated that what we're looking at, what we're measuring in adaptation with indicators is not adequately capturing 
complex and locally specific conditions of slums, and it leads to policies and programs that do not address their most urgent needs. The communities know the climate impacts they are most at risk of and the solutions that will work best. So that's counted. That's sort of illustrating this is the problem, um, and this is how, how big and important it, and urgent it is. And there's this, then there's this question of change it. Okay, so we know what the problem is. We know what the impacts are, at least some, some idea of them. So what needs to happen to create change? And this blog has a call for city lead leaders worldwide to improve the resilience of vulnerable communities make, by making that a top priority. City leaders must invest in measures that help vulnerable communities withstand climate impacts from basic infrastructure to nature-based solutions. Um, you know, and this must be done without evicting or displacing communities. So without actually making the problem worse. Um, you know, as Melissa addressed in, in her talk, the, the fact that U.S. flooding policies can actually more deeply entrench inequality, that's what we want to avoid here. Um, you know, and then this change also looks like adaptation requiring a fundamental shift in how cities make decisions. People living in poverty and marginalized groups who often have little or no political voice today must be part of the decision-making process. So this blog goes on to cite a couple of examples of communities that are making good progress on adaptation. And it looks at, okay, so that's what needs to happen here, but how do we scale it and what does that look like? You know, it's creating a more systemic shift. It's not just having all these examples where things are going better. It's how do we make more places like that? How do we scale that up to create a more systemic shift? Um, and so in this case, it's been this broad effort that's being led by UN Habitat, supported by the Global Commission on Adaptation, um, to bring marginalized com communities into city planning processes and resilience plans. Um, you know, and it also notes that cities should not be expected to go this alone and that national governments and international donors need to step up to support the community-led, to need to step up their support for community-led climate action in cities. Um, so this is one example, and I know that uh, my time is running out. I don't want to take more than, than I do, um, but I do think it might be helpful to just kind of start a conversation with you as journalists in training about sort of how the World Resources Institute um, addresses these issues and some of the resources that we have that might be helpful for, for you in your work um, as, as you, you know, as we all seek to improve the way things are. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we're going to keep moving on just to keep on time and come back to some more questions in the end. So thank you. Um, so now um, I welcome Donald Sampson to share some thoughts with us. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Donald Sampson. And I'm uh, the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians Climate Change Project Director. The Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians uh, is a consortium of over 50 tribes from Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Alaska, and California. And uh, the Affiliated Tribes is, uh, works on a variety of issues, healthcare, education, natural resources, uh, um, energy, uh, uh, and climate change is one of those from the natural resource field. Uh, and so uh, we're one of a number of intertribal organizations across the country that are that work collaboratively uh, on climate change impacts. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, sorry, I've got the wrong presentation up. One second, apologize. Okay, are we okay there? ATI's Climate Change Project, uh, the State of Northwest uh, Climate Impacts and Planning, and then also the fourth National Climate Assessment. Don, we can't see your, your slides yet, just so you know. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Um, can you see that now? No, we still can't. But if, if you'd like, I can pull this up and share it from my end. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. I'll go ahead and do that now. Okay. Okay, you have that? 
I do. Okay, I'll start sharing. You can tell me when to advance. Okay. Um, so uh, the uh, we'd like to talk briefly about the the project itself, uh, state of our climate impact planning, and then also the national uh, climate assessment. Next slide, please. So uh, the HNI works um, on four major goals uh, for climate adaptation planning in particular, uh, to make sure that our tribes are aware and engaged on uh, federal, state, and tribal climate uh, change programs, um, that we also serve as a clearinghouse and coordinator of tribal and intertribal efforts, not only in the Northwest, but across the country. We work with uh, a number of organizations, including tribes on the uh, East Coast, the United Southern and Eastern tribes as well, which is 30 tribes from Maine to Florida to Texas. Uh, we also work uh, on the regional, national, international level. We're involved in the national climate assessment. Uh, we work closely with the House and Senate committees on the climate crisis. And uh, we had representatives at the Paris Climate Accord and uh, have worked with tribes to participate in the We Are Still In effort uh, nationwide. Last, we help uh, tribes to secure funding. As mentioned earlier, uh, there's only about $15 million nationally for tribes some 574 tribes to uh, conduct any type of uh, climate vulnerability assessments or, or adaptation planning. Next slide, please. So uh, these are just some examples, and you're probably familiar with this, of the impacts in the Northwest. We're seeing uh, long-term warming. Ocean acidification is a huge impact for uh, particularly our coastal tribes, but also uh, in the Columbia River, uh, of course, our salmon populations are impacted by the ocean, ocean acidification uh, impacts as well as uh, habitat impacts. Next. Uh, sea level rise. As people were talking about sea level rise, we're seeing this impact across the country uh, in places in Alaska, uh, the Kivalina uh, native village is having to relocate. So we have you know, native uh, American tribes who are refugees in their own country, climate refugees, and are having to relocate. Um, the Chittimachi in Louisiana, of course, have, uh, are relocating from uh, their Aboriginal territories. The Quinault in Washington uh, and the Shinnecock Indian Nation in New York. Next slide, please. We're seeing impacts in, in snowpack. This has an effect on our salmon populations, our fish and wildlife, our forest health. And we know that uh, uh, we're seeing this trend continuing and the uh, impacts increasing uh, on an annual basis. Next slide. Of course, glaciers. Uh, we just came from uh, the uh, Salish Kootenai uh, Indian Reservation, Montana, where they're seeing the glaciers uh, receding and know that by 2050, many of these glaciers of the park, which is in their homeland, will be gone. This is a critical source for their water, for their lake, and their uh, agriculture. Next. We've seen a change of stream flows, and this is really affecting our salmon populations. As the juvenile salmon migrate uh, to the ocean, we're seeing stream flows uh, uh, really impacted uh, their migratory survival. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, we're seeing rising water temperatures, particularly in the Columbia River Basin, where uh, we have a series of dams, and uh, these in, uh, there's in, uh, viruses and disease and high water temperatures are killing thousands and thousands of adult and juvenile salmon every year. Next. As I mentioned, we've seen extreme die-offs of sockeye. Next. And sturgeon. These are all critical food sources for our tribal people. Our subsistence people rely on this for our subsistence, for our annual ceremonies, as well as our commercial fisheries. Next. We're seeing forced mortality on fire, huge fires in the Pacific Northwest, burning millions of acres. Uh, places, the next slide, please. <clears throat> and places like the Colville Indian Reservation in Washington, the Spokane Indian Reservation, uh, the forest lands are, uh, are a very important, important part of their commercial uh, income. And they've seen huge catastrophic wildfires and now uh, losing a lot of their habitat for uh, key wildlife that provide food for the community. Next. 
We're also seeing the impact of uh, on migratory animals. Uh, and particularly up in Alaska, we're seeing uh, thawing permafrost, decreasing Arctic sea ice, and it's threatening the traditional uh, livelihoods of people. About 87% of Alaska Native communities are experiencing uh, these impacts, particularly some of the erosion that we see from uh, the, the rivers flooding uh, their Aboriginal homelands. Next. So for tribes, it's really uh, affecting not only their, their health, but their culture and their um, spirituality. Uh, we're seeing these impacts to their communities. Where I come from on the Umatilla Indian Reservation, we had to cancel our feast, not only because of climate change and declining salmon populations, but also because of COVID. Uh, we couldn't gather together in our community at our longhouse to have our first food ceremonies. Those first food ceremonies are a critical part of our cultural traditions that are millennia old and really bring back that spirituality connection uh, to the beginning of time. Next. So this is an overview in, uh, of uh, the, uh, the impacts that we see, of course, but really important part of that is uh, how it affects tribal people. Next, please. A little, I like to talk a little bit about the Fourth, fourth uh, National Climate Assessment. Uh, many of you might be familiar with. Uh, there's a couple of sections, one that deals with the Northwest and one that deals with indigenous people. And this is an overview. Next. So we know that our, our uh, frontline communities uh, are in being impacted both in terms of our economies and agriculture, our hunting and gathering in particular. Uh, we've seen disease impacts on deer populations here where I live on the reservation. In over three years, the white-tailed deer population, because of th this disease, which has been uh, really uh, uh, pronounced because of climate, we lost 93% of our white-tailed deer population. That's a very important part of our food, food source. Our, our fishing enterprises uh, and our uh, ceremonial fishing is a very important part of, the, of our livelihood in the Northwest. Next. We also know that there are physical, mental, and uh, indigenous values-based health at risk. Uh, many of our tribal people are understanding that uh, when we had a gathering most recently, along the river at Celilo Falls, a great uh, salmon feast. Uh, many of the people gathered, and as a result of that, uh, praying and, and conducting these ceremonies, not only were they there in a gathering, but COVID came into the situation. That then spread back to their communities, and now many of those communities uh, in, that were participants of that ceremony have spread COVID into their communities. Next. We also know that um, we have a number of barriers in, in terms of being able to manage our own resources. People know about uh, our fight with US government and Standing Rock, where we're trying to protect our traditional waters, the lands. Uh, and so, uh, but yet at the same time, we are being uh, uh, opposed by the Trump administration, water cannons, uh, tear gas, uh, by trying to stand up for those the sacred water that is so important uh, to our communities. We also know that there's a lot of uh, uh, institutional racism and bias against tribes going on to their lands, their traditional lands, and actually even forest lands where they have reserved treaty rights uh, as part of their negotiation with the United States to gather these foods. Next. So uh, we are really trying to work as hard as we can. Uh, as, as was mentioned it's by Sunshine at the beginning, some 574 tribes across the country and only about 50, less than 10%, have uh, the resources from the federal government to conduct any type of climate uh, vulnerability assessment or an adaptation plan. So we're woefully underfunded uh, to really uh, analyze how we can become more climate resilient. Next. This is a, a diagram of a picture of uh, areas across the country. As you can see in yellow are the uh, various Indian reservations. And you can see uh, where planning and assessment has been done, uh, where we're looking at adaptation planning, some of the research that we're doing. Uh, 
uh, and really trying to work with youth and cultural uh, continuity. Uh, so this is, gives you a picture of, of where we're at now, but we've got a long ways to go in order to be able to uh, get all four, 574 tribes at some state where they can assess the impacts of, of climate. Next, please. Uh, another uh, key message of is the uh, of impact to the livelihoods on our economy, uh, and that really proactive management can increase the resiliency of many of our natural resources. Many of our tribes are starting to look at how we can protect our natural resources, uh, and particularly uh, places like Navajo Nation. And I think that's a really good example, next slide please, of where there's a convergence of um, social and economic uh, inequality and climate change. As you know, uh, on Navajo Nation has the highest infection rate per capita in the US compared to any state. It's the largest reservation, uh, 27,000 miles, uh, and there's 173,000 people living on the Navajo uh, Indian Reservation. Uh, some 300 people have died there. And healthcare, uh, some of, in healthcare on the Navajo, some people have to drive nearly three hours to a hospital. Navajo, Navajo only has about 200 hospital beds, about one third of the households. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> one third of the houses, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Navajo, uh, and then I'll come back to salmon. One third of the households have no running water or electricity. Can you imagine that? Americans use about 88 gallons of water per day. On Navajo, they might use two to three gallons per day. The unemployment rate is 40%. There's high rates of diabetes, heart conditions, cancer, lung disease. There's radiation exposure from abandoned uranium mines. Uh, lack of housing has created multi-generational housing uh, which is easy to spread viruses. And then last is the lack of infrastructure, roads, internet, electricity. Um, this shows the salmon and the importance of salmon to our culture. So imagine us, number one, seeing a decline of our salmon populations from drought and temperature, uh, not even enough to conduct our ceremonies. Number two, when we conduct those ceremonies, we're at risk of uh, COVID. And three is that um, now we're really struggling spiritually, economically, and from a community health perspective, how we continue these traditions going forward. Next slide, please. Back to Navajo with water, infrastructure, etc. Imagine you um, and their people being told to wash their hands, stay at home. But what if you can't? What if you can't do that? What if you have to leave your home to draw water? As I mentioned, a third of the Navajo people don't have electricity or water, running water. But you have to leave your home to draw water from a public tap just to have water to drink or to cook. Or if you're trying to draw water from a well that's drying up due to overuse or climate change and droughts and might be tainted by uranium mining. Imagine those conditions you might think that's a third world country, but that's an example of what's happening here in America and places like Navajo and other Indian reservations around the country. So as you can see, the infrastructure is really important. We're, we're being affected uh, in, uh, in very severe ways. Many of our communities have no resources to address these types of issues. Next slide, please. Here's the Quinault Indian Reservation. They have to move their entire reservation. This is on the coast of uh, Washington. I was there this spring and the village, entire villages have to be re relocated to higher uh, ground. Next, please. Health, as I mentioned, health is a big impact in, in tribal communities. Not only do we all, already have the worst healthcare in America, uh, when these epidemics have hit uh, our communities uh, are you know, dispropor disproportionately impacted. The Trump administration was supposed to provide almost $8 billion for tribes. They withheld half of that for months and months and months. Well, states and counties were receiving funds. Tribal governments across the country were denied funding. Next, please. So we are frontline communities and we are attempting to do the best we can using our social 
coherence, our traditional knowledge, and our capacity to survive. We've been survivalists for a long time, uh, and we've uh, survived uh, the impact of America, uh, the genocide in America, and we're prepared to survive again. And so this, this is a big challenge for us today. Next slide. We do some regional training similar to what uh, the Metcalf Institute. And so this is one of the camps that we do somewhere. It's a one a week long camp. And we, we uh, work with tribes across the country to train them in terms of developing their adaptation plan, preparing uh, the community for these impacts. Next. Here's where we've done this over the past few years uh, in Idaho, uh, in Washington, and most recently with the Salish Kootenai tribe in Montana. Uh, this upcoming uh, year, we've had to postpone our, our camp, which we bring some 15 to 20 tribes, 70 participants. Uh, we had planned to go to Anchorage, Alaska uh, because of COVID. We postponed that until uh, the spring of, of 2021. Next slide. These are our, our representatives. We had people, as mentioned, from Maori, from New Zealand, United Nations, UNITAR program, uh, and tribes from throughout the Pacific Northwest and East Coast. Next slide. These are some of our tribal leaders, uh, our relatives from Maori, who actually did a, hot, a climate haka. And so as we do this, we engage and participate and share our cultural and traditional knowledges with each other. Next slide. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time and look forward to any questions. Thank you, Don. Um, so, so, so many things to cover here. Um, thank you for that. Um, to each of you for, for sharing your insights with us. Um, we don't have very much time left, so I'm going to pose a question to all three of you and um, would appreciate each of your thoughts on this. Um, so obviously we have all of these um, major um, opportunities with regard to adaptation, all of these things that need to be addressed, um, but there is this real financial barrier in addition to other barriers as well, especially related to governance and COVID and all these other things. So if you, you know, like could wave a magic wand and, um, and um, to, to figure out how to structure kind of the economic response to allow these adaptation measures, what might that look like for each of your sectors or interests? This is Don. I'd, I'd like to just uh, mention briefly is that the, the tribes across the country have uh, been very um, closely connected to uh, the climate uh, uh, crisis committees, both at the House and the Senate, knowing that there was uh, opportunity for infrastructure legislation. Uh, we really wanted to take an opportunity to make sure that the very simple things like water and sewer uh, in places like Navajo or the ability to relocate uh, villages uh, communities, native communities that are impacted from a uh, storm surge or sea level rise, or the ability to uh, uh, put implement new uh, renewable energy opportunities for, for water, for energy, for housing, uh, rather than go back to the old uh, fossil fuel based strategies, we want to use that infrastructure legislation and the funding to try to start transitioning to a clean energy economy. Thanks, Don. Rebecca, please. Yeah, just to take a, a stab at a quick answer. I mean, I think there is, it becomes clear if we think about the fact that adaptation is good development and adaptation is keeping vulnerable people safer from shocks, right? Whether the shock is climate change, you know, whether it's a big storm, drought, or it's COVID, a lot of times the same measures can be effective for both. Um, I could go into examples, but I don't think we have time and I want to Give Melissa the, the last word, but you know, adaptation is good development, just protect people from shocks. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you. No, and I'd echo both of those sentiments and also say, 
I think the best thing we can do is really shift the paradigm in how we think about adaptation. Right now, we wait for really bad events to occur, people to get hurt, and then we come in on the back end, push a lot of money down and say, all right, we'll try to make you whole, but a lot of people won't get made whole, especially the most vulnerable, and it'll be really costly with very little oversight. And we could completely change that paradigm, give people money up front, that allows enough time for planning, for real community input and engagement that's fair and equitable, and it costs a lot less. You know, decades of studies have shown investing $1 up front saves four to $7 on the back end. And most importantly, it keeps people from losing their lives and their homes and their communities. We just need a full scale flip in both when we spend money and who gets to make the decisions, which is possible if we do it up front. Excellent. These are wonderful points and, um, and something that, um, I think Rebecca said that that uh, also is really resonating here is the fact that communities know what they need and um, and we need to listen to communities a lot more. Um, so thank you so much for all of your insights and um, and the work that you do. And um, thanks to all of you who joined us today for this webinar. We're, we're thrilled to have had your, your um, participation. And we hope that you'll come back tomorrow to join us for the final lecture in this series, which will look at public health and climate change. And um, until then, keep in mind that all of the, the videos from this week's lecture series are posted on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel, and you can see them there. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Wash your hands. Bye. <laughs>